Thank you. My name is Kelly Rodriguez. I am the CEO of Forge. Uh, we are a liquidity and custody platform for private companies. Think of us as kind of like a stock market for private tech companies. Um, before I start, I want to just call out that the innovation theme of this, of this um, panel is extremely important to all of us. We think of it as a national treasure. Uh, I'd like to point out that there are 344 companies now Maybe in the world. Maybe a global treasure. Global it's a treasure. Global treasure. Yes, we have I like a that. member of the global Thank community you. with us. <laughs> uh, we are we we are seeing 344 companies now in the world that have a valuation of greater than a billion dollars. Uh, there's aggregate valuation of the top 300 companies, private companies in the world, is 1.2 trillion, um, and. If you take notice, in the last five to 10 years, companies have started staying private a lot longer. The companies that I'm repre rep uh, re representing here with the 344 have been private for between five and 18 years already. And 10 years ago, on average, a company would go public in about six years with a valuation of $500 million. There's about 800 of those companies in the world now. Um, and this is pertinent for two reasons. One. Uh, at Forge, it's our mission to enable and protect the innovation economy. Uh, what that means is liquidity. Companies have typically gone public faster to get liquidity to continue the dream. And we have a belief that innovation and the talent that's required to fuel innovation requires liquidity over that duration of private existence. But it's also relevant as a founder because I know as a guy I had to raise money myself, it wasn't just about the money, it was about all the systems, the frameworks, and the support that you get to run a company for 12 or 13 years. And so it's no wonder that uh, you're seeing companies stay private longer. My esteemed panelists here are also protectors, patrons, and supporters of the private innovation economy. Um, let me introduce Tim Draper first. Besides being the inventor of viral marketing, he is one of the most famous, globally known venture capitalists in the world. He was responsible for the forming of Draper Associates, DFJ, and the Draper Venture Network. His companies include Coinbase, Robinhood, Skype, Tesla, Baidu, SolarCity, Box, and SpaceX, just to name a few. He also happens to know a thing or two about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, as he's one of the first major investors in the world to get into it. Uh, to his left, or I'm sorry, to, his, to the far left, we have Rudy Klein-Thomas, who's managing partner of Mastery, specializes in identifying early stage startups and advises some of the world's best known professional athletes who are looking to invest in the innovation economy. Oh, thank you. Um, Rudy has invested in Lime and Allbirds and Uber and Zoom. Uh, and Steve Tidball in the middle here is joining us as our representative as a founder and CEO of Volibok. And Volibok is in the science and technology of disrupting and creating the future of clothing. Steve's gonna to talk to us a little bit about what we'll be wearing in about five or 10 years. <laughs> but his inventions uh, were featured in 2018 as the, uh, <laughs> as the Times Best Innovation of the Year. Uh, they've also created solar charge jackets and he's wearing right now pants that are supposed to last 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> Do they need to get washed, I hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, but let me start with some questions. So, so Tim, um, <laughs> <laughs> you got the pants? Um, so, Tim, as, as somebody who's seen things early um, and, and, and had to pick without any precedent, how do you do that? Actually, you, you almost answered the question yourself because we're – we're looking for that thing that doesn't have precedent. And, and it, was the, it was the weird ones that became incredible. Like Hotmail, Hotmail was um, a, a couple of guys, it was their second idea. They came with one, it was their second idea and they said, we wanna give away free email. And then I, I said, and then? You know, like what, <laughs> what are we gonna, how are we gonna make money? And, uh, and that was sort of a weird thing. And then Skype, was two guys who were considered outlaws of the U.S. because they had created Kaza, and they, they uh, came to us with a really interesting proposal, and, and it was their second idea. So it was kind of interesting that that happened. And then, you know, 
<laughs> Tesla was an electric car. There hadn't been a successful car company started for 50 years. And, and I, I thought, well, you know, uh, it may be interesting, but a uh, big part of that was um, when you realize that, you, that an electric car can outperform a gas car. And so that was when I started to think, oh, this is interesting. We could do something with that. And then, um, oh, God, <laughs> Twitch started out as Justin TV, a guy following himself with cameras everywhere he went during the day. And then when it became Twitch, it was people watching other people play video games. Yeah. I mean, these were odd, unusual companies. They were all, and Bitcoin, my God, it's a, it's a currency that's virtual. I mean, all these things, they were very unusual, but really interesting people came in and they made those, um, and Equidate, those guys were, you know, kind of yahoos. Yes. And finally you came in and stabilized the business. But, um, but all of these businesses, when, when I know I've got a winner is when it, it kind of takes off in a weird way, something nobody really expected. And the business itself is not completely defined. And, um, and I, actually I learned that um, if you have a, the larger your partnership, the less likely you are to find those companies because all those smart people will find all the things that's, yeah. that are wrong with that business and not the thing that could go right. So I, what I do is I ask myself the question, what if this works? And I'm willing to lose a third, a half of the time, knowing that, you know, Robin Hood is a 500 times on the money and Carta is 200 times on the money, they can make up for a lot of mistakes. And so that's what I'm looking for. It's a very kind of an unusual, you won't, <laughs> you won't see a lot of venture capitalists admitting this, but that is the way it works. Right, so um, let's turn it over to, to Steve. So Steve, you've got an idea that that Yeah, this is definitely me. weird enough. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to have a software company come up here and talk. It just was going to be too boring. I'm sorry. Um, Steve, talk to us about the crazy looks you got and how you came to discover bionic clothing. Okay, well, I think, I think our, all our ideas get called crazy, like almost straight away. And it, like, the minute we worry is when that doesn't actually happen. And so 95% of um, people kind of look at our stuff and go, this isn't going to work. Um, th the way we look at it is we basically try to turn the business into um, a serendipity machine. I think the reality that is not often acknowledged is just how much chance and serendipity play a role in innovation. And I, I worked in advertising for 15 years before this where you watch all the best and weirdest ideas die. And we, we came up with this concept of what if you could turn an entire company into an R&D machine, not just like 2% of it or 5% of it or a, or a nod to it, but actually make the entire company all about bonkers mm. moonshots, essentially, is what we try and do. Um, and the reality is, um, out of that comes some really interesting ideas, some of which shouldn't work, um, some, of, some of which you do get to work. Like, so to, to give a very practical example, um, the, one of the latest wonder materials is graphene, which was isolated in 2004 um, in Manchester in the UK uh, by two Russian scientists. And it's just one, it's just one atom thick. And it's set to revolutionize various industries on a time scale of which no one is actually particularly sure. Uh, and one of our bets was that if you could bring this into clothing first, it's automatically interesting. It, it does some things that other, things, uh, that other materials can't do. It can, it can store and distribute heat in very strange ways like you might expect a radiator to do. Um, and so we go on these really interesting journeys around innovation where you start with some Russian scientists who discover something really experimentally. Uh, we then worked with partners in Europe, the same guys who'd built Michael Phelps' swimsuit that got banned and smashed all the records, and to get that first graphene jacket out. And then we, we, don't, we tend not to stop there because I think uh, innovation too often stops with the, the brand story and we actually push that further, further to customers. So we, we went out and we said, look, we don't quite know what this does yet. It's, so it's part jacket, part experiment. Buy it, test it, tell us what happens. And so we take the serendipity and chance and we take it all through the line. We build our company around it, we then create products around it, and then we take that serendipity and chance 
out into the customer's world. And we, we have some very experimental customers, sort of a lot of guys in um, finance <laughs> and uh, uh, explorers, adventurers, some really interesting people. So they come back with really interesting answers. They take your stuff apart. They tell you how you should rebuild it. So that's how we think about innovation. We kind of try and s spread it all the way through the business rather than just like a nod at the very start. Great. Thank you. Is there any special way you, you have to wash it? Does it shrink? Um, no, it's absolutely fine. It's more likely to hurt your washing machine than your washing machine. Will hurt. <laughs> well, those are graphene pants. Um, these are these are actually hundred-year pants. So you could you could hold a blowtorch on me right now, and I'd be okay as long as it's on my bottom. Any blowtorches <laughs> in the house? Um, okay, wild. Rudy. So Ru Rudy, uh, we're we're not allowed to mention who your clients are. Right. Uh, but Rudy represents uh, some of the best-known athletes in the world, um, and there's tons of stories about athletes that invest poorly or invest in. Uh, Subway sandwich shops, but what has your journey been to get athletes into the likes of Uber and Lime and, and, and bring them into the innovation economy? Well, it's, it's taken a couple different steps. So, you know, after school, um, after I graduated from school, I graduated with a finance and accounting degree and I had a passion for sports. And the only way at the time that I thought I could apply that was being a sports agent. So I did that initially. And um, to my chagrin, I figured out that uh, I was doing more babysitting than actually, you know, doing anything else. So I didn't want to spend the rest of my life babysitting athletes. Um, so after a couple of years, I realized that the real need was um, actually, you know, investing their money and helping them save it, actually. So um, after four years of being an agent, um, I shifted over to managing their finances, and um, that's where I spent most of my career. So I did that for about 10 years. In 2007, um, we, had, uh, we were making money investing in the tech space, and uh, I started going out to TechCrunch Disrupt on my own, uh, just trying to figure out you know, how to get into the industry. I didn't meet you then at that time. <laughs> so I didn't see you out there. But uh, um, at the time, I just started connecting with VCs and learning the industry. I met a uh, gentleman by the name of Josh Koppelman at First Round Capital. Yeah, sure. he, was, uh, he was in Philly at the time. My firm was in Philly. And he said, you know what? If you want to learn it, come to my office, and I'll teach you how this goes. And after six months, he started letting me uh, invest with them. How active are the actual clients? I mean, do you have some, uh, some athletes that really are interested in the technology and get in and want to diligence with you? Well, yeah, it's their money, right? So at the end of the day, nobody wants to lose it. And I always say that the proponent that we start with is education first. So um, I'm always a purveyor of educating first and then going from there. You know, and if they have the propensity to want to invest in, then we'll take it to the next level. But it always starts with the education first. Yeah. Great. One of the things I'm fascinating in uh, is we, we have tracked and, and our company looks at and covers these very large unicorns in the world. But, but Tim, you've been in venture capital for a long time. The trend in the last four years has been later stage, bigger deals, enormous checks privately. But you went back. You went back to sort of the roots of it. Talk about why you went back earlier and smaller into the early stage. Well, we have an, we have an interesting strategy. Um, my high profile Draper University and the Draper Venture Network generate an enormous amount of deal flow in my long history in venture capital. And, uh, and that deal flow is early stage, and it comes in, and we are, um, and, and what we're in effect building is this, this machine that, uh, that says, look, if you're 20 to 30 years old and you wanna start a business, Draper has a solution for you, whether it's Draper University or, or the Boost uh, Accelerator or or Draper Associates funding, or something in the Draper network. I love it because it's, it's the life cycle. It's the entire life cycle. Yeah, and so we will fund these companies, and we get big returns on a f on a few of them. And overall, I think we do outperform at the early stage. Now we have been historically handing those over to those late stage groups, handing over gems. And because we didn't have sort of the, the larger fund. And so uh, we are remedying that. And, um, and we're, in effect, thinking about venture capital as, as being vertically integrated. So that if we're getting them from the beginning, we can take them all the way and uh, take the winners all the way and prune it as it goes. And I think that that ends up being a really interesting model. You know, when the gap vertically integrated 
that was when that company just took off. When they started manufacturing their own, their own clothes, they got rid of Levi's, they, they went into their own clothes. So we're looking, we're saying, wait, we already generate a huge number of deals, a very, I mean, a decent percentage of the market share of the early stage comes through our right. door. Now, we get 20,000. Are, are you taking yeah. 100 meetings? Uh, well, we get 20,000 in a year and we'll fund 20 of them. And, uh, and so, sure, some slip away and we make some big mistakes. <laughs> By the way, those are the ones that kill you. Not the ones you do that fail, but the ones you didn't do that succeed. They're the killers. Um, What's the best story of somebody coming back and saying, you didn't do it? <laughs> well, we've had many. Um, the biggest, uh, biggest failure, I, it's always failure to act, um, was that I met Larry and Sergey on an <laughs> airplane. And I brought that deal to my partnership and I said, these guys are really good and they got a cute name. And it's a lot of technology and they're really good. And my partner said, we already have there's six four, search four engines engine, right? in our portfolio. What are you thinking? And I said, I don't know, four PhDs from Stanford, you know? And, and uh, anyway, that was one failure. We've had um, many others actually. Um, and I, I could go into them. The ones I claim total responsibility for are Netflix. I mean, I knew Reed Hastings was brilliant. I knew that he had an interesting plan. But the whole idea of, of starting by selling DVDs by, by US mail made me think, Reed, what are you thinking? We're going to be streaming in two years. And he said, they're not ready for streaming yet. And I, I should have listened, you know, big mistake. Anyway, I, I missed LinkedIn too, yeah. so. So Steve, Steve what's, the, what's the craziest application that you see uh, moving forward in the, in the world of clothing and apparel? What's, what's sort of out there? Well, I think the, the way we look at it is, um, people often think our ideas are particularly crazy because they're used to what clothing should do. So for the last 50,000 years, clothes have been used for, for very basic purposes to keep you warm, dry, cold, safe, sometimes for status. Um, but over the next 50,000 years, the reality is they're going to be used for physical and mental enhancement. Um, and the reason we're going to look to clothing for that is because you wear it every day. So, so interestingly, one of, one of the things about Google Glass was it required like a, a fundamental behavioral change. You'd have, to, you'd have to wake up each day and like, put on a headset. And like, people aren't used to that. But like, every day we put on clothing. We're used to changing our clothing. So I think clothes are a very natural vehicle for all sorts of um, enhancements. So the, the way where we're looking at it is I think, uh, I think basically you ha it'll increase the plasticity of human life, essentially. You're looking at enhancing sensory perception, enhancing strength through exoskeletons. I think we will start to have sort of like sci-fi-like intelligent clothing. I think the key challenge, though, really, when you look at that 50,000 your time scale is how do we compress it while I'm still alive? <laughs> that's, that's the kind of challenge I'm looking at. And so the way we do it is we, we kind of look at other industries and we, we've thought a lot about like how you disrupt the innovation model itself. So if you go back historically, there are, there are very big gaps between the moment of invention and the moment of commercialization. So if you look at computers, you're on a time scale of like 161 years between Babbage and the Apple One. Uh, if you look at electric cars, you're on a time scale of around 180 years between like 1828 and like Tesla proving sort of like successful. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to squeeze that 180 years down to something more like 10. Um, so to, to talk about like how innovation is a national treasure, like the reality is I, I work in London. Um, London is a, is a nice scene, but the reality is if, if I'm heading for innovation, I come and work with American companies. Yeah. Like we've I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. Is the, are the systems, is the scaffolding in place for you there, and how do you see it comparing and evolving to what um, you here? The, the reality is no. Um, uh, and I think, I think the worry for us is as uh, our country moves towards becoming an increasingly insular country, I worry a lot about innovation. I think at any point if a, a person or a company or a country becomes increasingly insular, I think you see innovation shutting down. I think you see innovation clustered 
uh, like you see it clustered in Silicon Valley, you see it, you see it sort of um, clustered in companies like Apple, but these are open, porous companies that have talent pouring into them. So m my worry when you have stuff shutting down specifically in the UK and shutting down in Europe is I just get on a plane and I come to America because if I want to work with great companies and great founders and we're working, working on a series of partnerships that will come out over the next few years, uh, America's it. I, I, come to the, I come to the guys in Boston, I come to guys in New York, I come to guys in um, the Valley because that's where it's happening. So it, it's our country, like my country, UK, yeah. that will miss out. It's, it's not the US. You're right, it is a global treasure. Yeah, it is a global yeah. treasure. Um, so, so Rudy, um, talk, talk to me about um, whether or not y you get into deals based on who your clients are. I think initially for sure, right? <laughs> so obviously, uh, you know, everybody, athletes are the most revered human beings on the planet. So um, that definitely was uh, an access point initially. I think nowadays, uh, the fact that, um, you know, there's more participation with athletes um, and the growth of sports and, and tech as well, too. We've become the bridge uh, of both industries, the, the, the tech and sports space. Um, and also, athletes are much more aware of the opportunity um, of just not just being investors, but the partnerships that are there. And they're using, you know, a lot of the products as well, too. I mean, any, any magazine that they open or any time they turn their, their television on or whatever, they're seeing some type of representation in reference to tech. So it's surrounding them now. Um, so educating them in reference to, you know, being investors and, and different partnerships and opportunities that are out there is much easier nowadays than it was before. Great. One of the <clears throat> points I wanted to make was that um, when we're studying the challenges of being a private company for, for 10 plus years, um, you know, the, the, the access to liquidity and maintenance of your, or, of your talent pool is a, is a critical component here. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious uh, about, um, Tim, your view uh, of, of policy. This, this conference um, combines uh, elements of asset uh, expertise and management with policymakers. Uh, I'm curious about your thoughts on uh, what the U.S. is doing around policy to support innovation and why uh, you think it would be valuable for someone to consider staying private. So, uh, yeah, this is really interesting. I'm seeing this transformation of the world and, you know, I'm always looking five years out, so bear with me. Um, it, this doesn't look this way right now, but I'm seeing this. Um, it starts with, it started for me with Bitcoin. All of a sudden there was a decentralized currency. Pe people could use it anywhere in the world. It wasn't, uh, you could go from Sudan to, to uh, Greece and not be a refugee. You could just pull your Bitcoin down and it could be a part of your life and you just keep it going. All of a sudden I started to think, wow, we we have this decentralization and various countries are now sort of competing across borders. So there's this virtual governance that's starting to happen where the, the Estonian government, had, the prime minister came to Draper University and he gave me a card and he's made me a virtual resident of Estonia. And, and, it, and as a result, anywhere in the EU, sorry, you're not in it anymore. Um, <laughs> we are at the any, moment. Anywhere in the EU, I can uh, start a business, buy real estate, open a bank account very easily without ever setting foot there. It made me start thinking that this decentralization is making us all one globe and much more of a, uh, where we're really much more attached than we used to be, where we used to be very tribal in those those geographic borders mattered more. And now you're seeing the, the pullback that happens before, the, before it actually happens. So long term, I think we're all going to be living on this beautiful pearl, and, and those borders are not going to mean that much. But short term, you're seeing people in power saying, I've got I've to hold on to that power, so I'm going to build this wall, or I'm going to hold my currency. And, and you see that in China and the U.S. Yeah, now, you say. also see competitive governments say, like Japan saying, oh, well, Bitcoin's a national currency here. And that starts attracting people. And as we're more mobile, we're going to be attracted to the places that are the most, the most innovative and, and open. And look, China and the U.S., 
it's stupid that we have any kind of a trade issue, and they love to make it a trade war or whatever. It's stupid. We are so much better off connecting. That, that relationship has been so good for so long. The idea that now you can't get your money out of China and the U.S. is trying to keep the Chinese from taking ideas or whatever. I, let it rip, boy. We're going to all be so much better off if we have open trade throughout the world. And this is, and this is it's coming, but um, there's a little bit of the roar of the dying lion. Uh, you know, a lion controls all of his territory and then his, he, he's, he's mad and he big, does the big roar and then he dies. <laughs> and I think that's probably going to happen and we're going to be much more open world. And governance, uh, a lot of it is going to be virtual. And I think a lot of it is also going to be um, privatized, uh, insurance-based. And I think that's going to be really interesting. We're going to have government is going to be as good at providing services as the guys who make your iPhone or, or the Samsung Galaxy. Uh, this is going to be really interesting. You know, we're seeing for the first time... Oh, one know, more thing. Yeah. And humanity <laughs> is going to move from this tribalism to a globalism. And I think it's going to be so, a sociological advancement yeah. that moves us much further along. So anyway, I'm thinking five, ten years out, so you know, it's not happening today. No, part of what we talk about is, is uh, innovation fueling a richer future for all of us and not just in, in, in financial and economic terms. One of the things that you should all know is the, the, the majority of these unicorn companies now are in China. There are now more of them in China than there are here in the U.S. And um, we've been over there a couple of times. And if a, if a company is Hong Kong based and is dealing in a U.S. denominated dollar, uh, there's a tremendous interest. Uh, from Western investors, investors all over the world to be in those deals. And, 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 and yet most of the mainland Chinese unicorns are completely inaccessible to Western investors unless you've got some incredibly uh, unique deal with the, with the Chinese government. Well, if they wanted to go, because I mean, I know we still have a lot of money tied up in China. We can't get it out. Um, right. And the Chinese can't get their money out to invest with us. So we're having, a, I mean, God, open it up. Make it all work. We, we're so much better off when we're, when we're working together with other countries. And eventually, it's going to be one world, so you might as well make it one world sooner than later. Agreed. And you guys are helping a lot. Well, we're, trying to, the, open up the, we're trying to open the, up the global access to private innovation companies so you can invest in any of the big name private companies that you can think of from anywhere in the world. Uh, there are clearly some policies in place now which limit investment from certain countries, but, uh, but this is, this is a, uh, a, a tidal wave coming, uh, and we're also seeing people starting to package these private securities in baskets. You're going to see that happen this year. We announced with uh, one of the largest banks in the world, BMP Paribas, who I think uh, their CEO was on a panel yesterday, that we're packaging. Uh, a basket of the top 20 or 30 private tech firms in the world and offering it uh, in sort of a, uh, a structured product all around the world. So families in Italy and insurance companies in Zurich and investors in Asia can come and buy, uh, you know, a slice of the top uh, private uh, U.S. firms. I know we're getting close to the end of our time. Are we, um, are we allowed to ask... Uh, if people want to ask questions in the crowd, or is this? A oh, I got more to say. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we want to hear about so, Bitcoin. We want to hear about that. Okay. Well, here's here's what's going to be happening. This is the most exciting time I've look. I was there for the internet revolution from the very beginning. I jumped in, loved it. Everything was fantastic. It completely transformed in, innovation or information, communication, gaming, entertainment, media. They all changed. Well, now. Bitcoin, the blockchain, smart contracts, and artificial intelligence are going to transform the biggest industries in the world. Not just finance, banking, and commerce, but, but insurance, and real estate, and government itself, and healthcare. Those are the trillion dollar industries. They're the biggest ones in the world. And when there is big tumultuous time, there's a big troublesome time, that is when the entrepreneurs thrive, and that's when venture capitalists 
make their best return. So we're really in a very exciting time. time. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. We got 31 you seconds. You guys say. You guys got anything to say in your 28 <laughs> seconds? All right. Thank you, Salt. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.